talk about today is, as the title suggests, the potential role of this phenomenon called sensitization in human drug addiction. That said, I'm going to ask for your indulgence right away uh, by proposing a, a secondary title. And this change reflects a broader interest in the potential role of sensitization and its related phenomena for also for individual differences in vulnerability to addiction, and also that I'm going to be focusing on one biological system in particular, and that is dopamine. As this audience no doubt knows, dopamine is probably the single best studied neurotransmitter in behavioral neurobiology. In the now more than 50 years since it was first identified, it's been implicated in two main behaviors. The first is in the ability to initiate voluntary movements. The clinical implications of this observation were noted immediately, and within less than a decade, um, the immediate dopamine precursor, L-DOPA, was established as a treatment for Parkinson's disease, and to this day, it remains the gold standard for treating the disorder. The second main effect noted in animal studies, particularly by work by people like Tony Phillips, Roy Wise, and others, is that dopamine seems to play an especially sensitive role in regulating responses to various rewards, including the tendency to self-administer drugs of abuse. Translating this work to humans, though, has proven to be much more complex. Neuroleptics have not been effective treatments for addictions. Moreover, the sheer lack of most effects of dopamine manipulations on addiction behaviors in humans has led some people to ask, whether dopamine has any role at all in drug self-administration in humans. Given this obvious discrepancy between the rich animal literature and the unclear effects in humans, I felt motivated to start more than a good 15 years ago now a series of studies, the objective being to map out perhaps more specifically the role that dopamine might be playing in drug self-administration in humans and try to understand how those effects might develop and change following initial exposure to these drugs through to more regular uh, recreational use, if you can call it that, onto the progression to severe substance dependence. The first studies that I'd like to tell you about use the pet ractopide method, a neuroimaging method that allows us to measure stimulated dopamine release in human brain. Most people are used to looking at these sort of images now, but in brief, the colored pixels correspond to those regions within human striatum where there are statistically significant differences between the brain imaging signal on the drug versus placebo test day. We certainly weren't the first to identify evidence of drug-induced dopamine release in human brain, um, but this study, published about 10 years ago, did in fact provide some of the clearest evidence that was available at that time that these effects were occurring preferentially within the ventral limbic striatum, that region of the striatum that corresponds most closely to what we would call nucleus accumbens in the rat. We've since gone on to see very similar effects following the intranasal self-administration of cocaine, as well as ingestion of an abused substance from a quite different pharmacological class, ethanol. Together, these findings from our group, as well as by others around the world, have provided now compelling evidence that in humans, as has been seen in laboratory animals, abused drugs across pharmacological classes increase dopamine release within the brain. The next question of interest has been, well, what is the behavioral significance of these drug-induced increases in dopamine transmission in humans? The method that we've used to get at this issue is the acute phenylalanine tyrosine depletion method. This method involves ingesting an amino acid mixture, basically a protein shake, that is selectively deficient in the amino acids required to make dopamine in the brain. As a result, there's a transient decrease in dopamine synthesis and dopamine transmission. The method has been well validated in microdialysis studies in rats, as well as PET studies in humans. The first hypothesis that we addressed was the possibility that dopamine might be remediating the pleasurable effects associated with most drugs of abuse. In the study shown here in the top left-hand corner, the participants were non-dependent um, but fairly regular cocaine users. 
They came into the laboratory on a series of occasions and then ingested intranasal doses of uh, varying strengths uh, of cocaine powder. What you can see is that there's a very nice linear dose-dependent effect on uh, self-reported euphoria. The higher the dose, the greater the cocaine-induced euphoria. The question of interest, though, was that if we decrease dopamine transmission, would this make the uh, drug feel less pleasurable, as if it were a lower dose? What you can see is that this did not at all happen. We did not see a diminishment in cocaine euphoria, nor any of the other pleasurable effects of the drug. We've since gone on to see very similar negative findings when we give amphetamine to non-drug abusers. The drug produced its prototypical uh, positive subjective effects, but the dopamine manipulations had no effect on these pleasurable effects of this stimulant drug. Nor have we found that dopamine manipulations alter the pleasurable effects of alcohol, or for that matter, smoking a cigarette. That's not to say we haven't seen any effects of these dopamine manipulations. To the contrary, we've seen a quite consistent series of uh, effects, um, effects that might be seen as falling more into a, a hypothesis usually referred to as the incentive salience view. In the example showing up on the screen now, participants were taking, uh, uh, took part in what's called a go-no-go -no -go task. In essence, they sit in front of a computer, up in the monitor come a series of numbers, and they learn by trial and error that if they press a button for some numbers, they'll win money, and if they, whereas if they press for other numbers, they'll lose money. In essence, they learn to press for certain stimuli and ignore others. When we put them in the low dopamine state, they lose the ability to preferentially respond to rewards. That is, in the circled highest, highest bar there, they make more commission errors. Their behavior becomes more erratic, and they can no longer focus their and responses specifically to rewards. We've also found that decreasing dopamine transmission in this way can affect self-administration behavior. In this first study, reported just over a decade ago, the participants were carefully screened, healthy, mild social drinkers. The participants in the morning ingested one of these different mixtures that either was a control mixture or the one that decreases dopamine synthesis. At the end of the afternoon, they were then presented with a series of canisters that contained various alcoholic beverages. There was red wine, white wine, vodka and orange juice, rye and ginger, and rum and coke. We then asked them to taste from these various beverages and rate them in different sensory qualities.